scapular fractures are uncommon. Um, the various different patterns. Is first, the fractures of the processes, which include the acromion, the spine, and the coracoid, and they make up about 15% of uh, scapular fractures. Then you've got body of scapular fractures, which account for about 50%. Glenoid neck fractures accounting for 25%, and those are essentially type A and type B. And then you get the intraarticular fractures of glenoid accounting for 10% of all scapular fractures. And there you would think about Ederberg's classification and the type 6, which was added by Goss. Whenever you think of scapular fractures, don't forget the associated injuries. The associated clavicle fracture and the glenoid neck fracture and the various combinations of the double disruption of the superior shoulder suspensory complex, the so-called floating shoulder. But more importantly, is often with scapular fractures, these are high energy injuries and there may be associated head injuries or chest injuries. And sometimes the associated injuries will define how you treat the scapular fracture. I'll talk about the indications for fixation or surgery at the end or various different treatments, but sometimes the actual uh, injuries to the patient, the chest and the abdomen and the head uh, will dictate the final treatment. We're gonna talk about the apophyseal fractures or the process fractures. And here's an example of a 43 male who sustains an injury to his shoulder. And we see that the clavicle is elevated <coughs> and there seems to be something happening at the lateral third of clavicle. You may think that this is a AC joint injury or rupture of the CC ligaments. But when you have a closer look, you'll find that the coracoid is going with the clavicle and you can see that there's a fracture of the base of the coracoid. If we have a look at these axial CTs, you'll find that uh, more easily seen is the fracture base of coracoid. Further down, if you change it to the lung views, you'll see the associated injuries to the lung with the uh, pulmonary contusion and the pneumothorax. So how do you treat these process fractures? Well, it's relatively undisplaced at the base, but the problem with the process fractures is the it gets tethered <coughs> by the intact coracoclavicular ligaments and pulled on by the conjoint tendon. And so what happens then is the coracoid pivots round and abuts onto the subscapularis and they get subcoracoid impingement. And that's the main problem with coracoid uh, or process fractures is one, delayed union or non-union, it's hard cortical compact bone um, with big forces going through it. And two, you then get impingement of various sorts. <coughs> he has his radiographs at six weeks. It hasn't really migrated much. You can see the gap at the base of the coracoid. And when you have a look at his MRI at uh, uh, four months, I'll run the axial views, you see tip of coracoid abutting onto subscapularis. And so that's going to give him subcoracoid impingement. That's going to give him pain when he goes into abduction and external rotation. Here we see the CT scan at uh, eight months and the clavicle has gone on to unite. You can see the union of the lateral third of clavicle fracture we're now coming down to the images where we will see the coracoid and we see the non-union at the base of the coracoid. Because it's pivoted around with the coracochromial ligament and the CC ligaments splinting it uh, superiorly and the conjoint tendon pulling down on a uh, 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 in a downward direction, you then get that subcoracoid impingement. In fact, at this stage, the patient elected not to have any sort of form of biosurgical treatment <clears throat> and accepted the outcome and lived not being able to go up and serve and play tennis anymore. Here we see a 31 year old who's fallen off uh, their bicycle, sustaining an injury, what looks like at the base of the acromion where it joins onto the spine of the scapula. And to me, that looks like it's not a fresh fracture. So it may be an old fracture that's been re-injured or is this an osochromiale? Remembering that the osochromiale has the meta, meso, and baso versions. <coughs> and so perhaps this is an osochromiale that has become disrupted in this fall. There's the radiographs, which you see at eight years. And that's the problem with the chromial spine, the chromial fractures and the spine fractures is that they tend to pull down under the pull or the activation of deltoid. And they then lead to subacromial impingement. Also because it's hard cortical bone, they're prone to delayed union, non-union. 
And so in young patients, particularly those who want function at shoulder height and above, I might be tempted to fix you. It's not an easy fix though. It's easy to get there, but there's hard forces placed across it. And often for these acromial fractures, spine fractures, you sometimes need to double plate them. And you're generally going for primary bone healing. So you want bone opposition and compression. When it comes to body fractures, it accounts for about 50%. And here the real problem with the body fractures is the relative medialization <coughs> of the glenoid, but really it's the lateralization of that body fragment, which then becomes quite prominent and quite sharp. And they feel it here, just underneath the axilla. They get this really tender, painful spot. Your options are to reduce it and fix it from day naught, or at a later date, if it remains symptomatic, you can still undertake a colectomy. The other problem with the body fractures, the pure body fractures, now not involving the glenoid neck, but pure body, is that they can sometimes angulate. As you can see here, you see it on your scapula Y view, beautifully seen on the volume rendered 3D CT, and they can sometimes then impair function of your scapula thoracic joint. <clears throat> glenoid neck fractures make up about 25%, <clears throat> and there's classically described two types, the A and B. A exits lateral to the base of the coracoid and B exits medial to the base of the coracoid. You'll often find these uh, glenoid neck fractures in conjunction with body of scapular fractures. And here we see how it's exiting under the spine of the scapula, scapula along the medial border of the scapula. But although here Goss has talked about the type C, it's really the types A and B and then variations of how it exits into the scapula. And here we see a 30 year old female who has a glenoid neck fracture exiting lateral to the coracoid. But there's more happening in here because at the back, I see that there's some mischief happening with the spine or the chromion. There's also an associated clavicle fracture. And so we have a clavicle fracture and a glenoid neck, which makes it a double disruption of the superior shoulder suspensory complex, or this is a floating shoulder beautifully seen on the volume rendered 3D CTs. We see looking from the back, the base of a chromion or the chromial spine fracture. We see the glenoid neck fracture, which is exiting lateral to the coracoid. And there are some crack lines running across the, the, the scapula, not classically like Goss's C, but exiting along the medial border of the scapula. We see that lateral translation of the scapula and that prominence, which might bother the person on the medial border. But for these glenoid neck fractures that have medialized, it's not about the prominence there. There it is about the medialization of the glenoid and the change of pull, the detensioning of the rotated cuff in relation to the glenoid and the humeral head, but also medialization of the glenoid under the acromion and changing the pull or the forces, the vectors of deltoid. She had uh, a few other multiple injuries. And uh, because it was a double disruption was quite significant of the clavicle, I elected to fix the clavicle and then reass reassess the scapula. And so there's a lot of things that worry me on this scapula. One is the chromial process. So that's gonna cause that acromion to dip down and she may get some impingement. The fact that the glenoid is medialized, the head is now underneath the acromion and detention the, the rotator cuff. We're going to struggle with elevation above shoulder height. And again, because it's medialized, we no longer have that rotational vector of deltoid deltoids vectors are more vertical and that might lead to pain and impingement. So a lot of things there worrying me in terms of medialization. If you haven't heard of it, the chromial index or the center edge angle, this idea that as you medialize in relation to the chromion, this was for elective surgery, not for scapular fractures, but it just shows you and highlights to you how the vector changes on how deltoid is pulling. And so if you have a the chromium that hangs far over the humerus, you tend to get a superior vector, you tend to run into cuff pathology. If you've got an acromion that's a little bit shorter, the vector of deltoid is then medially based and they tend to get arthritis. On this occasion, due to all those bad features, the fact that I wanted to fix the chromial spine, and in fact, once you've exposed the back of the scapula, it's not difficult to get to that lateral border of the scapula, the interval between uh, teres minor and infospinatus. You may argue that I didn't need to fix that medial side, but this plate is in part fixing the medial side, but it's also trying to support 
that uh, spine of a chromium process, uh, stabilizing the glenoid, stabilizing the glenoid neck. And once you've returned the anatomy, because this was essentially an extra articular fracture of the shoulder, she achieved really good function and good function above shoulder height. When it comes to glenoid uh, intraarticular fractures, it makes out at about 10%. And here we see the radiographs of a 41 year old with something happening here on the inferior glenoid. It just doesn't look right. You can get dedicated views or better views. You would want to have brought that round and get a direct AP view of the scapula. But if we have a look at the axial slices here coming down, chromal spine looks good, basal coracoid looks good, nice gap there in the subcoracoid space. But we see all the mischief happening in the glenoid. We see it better with the sagittal and coronal views, particularly focusing here on the top on the sagittal view. You see how that inferior third, inferior half of the glenoid has been knocked off. And that's the classic Ederberg 2. I'll go through the classification in a moment, but a classic Ederberg 2. And the problem with this is that the glenoid is no longer congruent but because of that subluxation, this humeral head is going to point load on that corner. And in a relatively young patient, you may want to fix that. It's also relatively easy to get to this one. It's a big piece and be controlled from the back. If ever you can fix a scapula from the back, although it's an unusual approach to take, it's actually quite easy to get there. If you need to fix your uh, glenoid or your uh, scapula from the front, a lot more mischief. And this was again fixed with that interval between infraspinatus and teres minor. He classified the intraarticular glenoids into five. So the small flake of the anterior or posterior aspect of the glenoid. Those essentially are the associated with shoulder instabilities, the bony bank art. Then this classic large bony fragment of the inferior part, which we've just seen the type two. The type three is a superior third <coughs> exiting medial to the base of the coracoid and its variations and sometimes you'll see also a disruption of the ac joint as everything migrates up superiorly the top fours is a split of the glenoid right across the body and the top five goes across the body and then down into the lateral border and goss added the type six when it comes to the indications for scapular fracture fixation or surgery they're all relative they're all relative there's no absolute indications really Essentially, if you have an intraarticular fracture, so one of the Ederberg classifications, if there's a displacement or a step of more than four millimeters, the shoulder is not a weight bearing joint, you can get away with quite a bit. And the younger you are, the more likely to operate on someone, someone in their 60s, 70s, you may say, well, if you get arthritis, the outcomes of arthroplasty for the shoulder are good. Maybe we'll just see how you go. If there's more than 20 or 25% of the articular surface involved, so a large bony bank heart. Watch out for them because they can sublux. If you decide to treat them non-operatively, if they're in a good position, that's okay. But re-x-ray them in a week and warn them. If something happens, if they feel a click or clunch or crunch, or suddenly it starts crunching inside there, don't wait, come back and have an x-ray. Because with those large bony bank hearts, it's not uncommon for them to just slip out relatively easily. If there's medialization of the scapula with the body fractures, this is more about lateralization of the body uh, where it digs in. When it comes to the medialization, that's where you've got that associated glenoid neck fracture or a, a floating shoulder. You'll accept less medialization because it changes the relationship of your rotator cuff to the humeral head and the glenoid. And it brings the humeral head underneath the acromion, which changes the force vectors of your deltoid, the center edge angle and the acromial index. The glenopolar angle, which is associated with your glenoid neck fractures, again, if you angle down and your angle drops less than 22 degrees, you're going to struggle with abduction. You're struggling to get to shoulder height and above. But if you're quite happy to lift down here below shoulder height, you don't need to fix it. As I say, all the indications for scapular fracture fixation are relative. Unfortunately, sometimes these patients are on you for quite a long time and you don't have the luxury of discussing it with them the absolute uh, reasons why you may or may not want to fix their scapula. If there's angulation here, it's more than 45 degrees. In different texts, I've read 30 degrees. That can cause problems with your scapular thoracic joint, and you may want to then fix the body of the scapula. Watch out with the processes. 
the coracoid and the chromium, one for delayed union slash non-union, and two for developing some forms of impingement. Have a look and see how much there is space there is in that subcoracoid space to start with. Ask the patient how much they want to do at shoulder height and above. If most of their life, like me, I scope people down here. I play World of Tanks down here. I don't need to do much work up there. You don't need to fix most of my scapular fractures. But if you're doing a lot of work at shoulder height and above, and you're going to run into problems with impingement, you might consider fixing those uh, processes, fractures earlier. Now, for the chromium and the spine, they're quite easy to get to. When you look at the base of coracoid, it's quite difficult to get to. And in fact, for those, you're better off fixing those percutaneously, looking at the morphology of your coracoid and planning your guide wire, because it's very difficult to get to and to see the base of coracoid. That was a quick uh, whistle-stop tour of scapular fractures. Thank you.